sure you signed in outside. There's a CLE sign in. Uh, if you want credit, it's Nebraska approved. There's also on your table little orange information cards. I've got CLE. And on the back side, there's also upcoming events for the OBA. So feel free to take that with you. Um, also, tell your friends and colleagues who were not able to make it that this is being recorded. Um, so no pressure right now being on film. But um, it's going to be recorded. Uploaded. The OBA has all of its CLEs recorded and uploaded. If you didn't know that, available online so that you can get CLE hours from home. This is going to be on there, so make sure you tell your friends and colleagues. Um, we are right now to have a number of beneficiary from the community uh, present with us. So if you all don't mind standing up, you be recognized. one of these lunches before or anyone who had class with them knows Professor Finner really needs no introduction. Uh, for everyone else who doesn't fall into one of those categories, um, I personally know I'm not capable of giving an introduction that tells of all the kindness that he's shown people throughout his years, nor am I able to give an introduction that really captures all the amazing things that he's been able to accomplish throughout his career. Uh, but to give you a, a short summary, if you're not affiliated with him or you don't know him, uh, Professor Finner is a longtime fixture at Creighton University, the School of Law. I know I've run into people out of state. Like, oh, I went to Creighton. I'm a Creighton. Here. Did you have Finner? Everyone says that. Everyone says Finner. So he was truly a fixture here. Uh, he retired from regular teaching in 2019. I use the term regular teaching because in July of last year, the School of Law bestowed upon him the title of Professor Emeritus. Um, he's also the past president of the Nebraska State Bar Association and is currently of counsel at the firm of McGill, Gottsteiner, Workman, and Lett. Uh, Professor Bitter, I know I speak for all of your former students, everyone here in attendance, when I say that I can't wait to hear what you have to say. So without further delay, I'll turn the podium over to you. Let me follow up on something Cameron just said. My wife and I were in England in December, and we were in Glastonbury and we had a car, and we had the car take us down to Gatwick Airport. So we go get in the line, back into Aer Lingus, and there were so we walk up, and this large African American man in front of us turns and says, "Well, anyway, Cameron, thank you very much." And uh, Cameron and his wife Jordan were both students of mine, and uh, they now have a three-month-old baby, their first baby. So congratulations. Uh, this speaking series is celebrating its 30th anniversary. And uh, so I want to thank you all for coming, and particularly I want to thank those of you who've been coming uh, pretty regularly since the beginning. And I guess special thanks to those of you who weren't born when it began. <laughs> As most of you know, I've retired from Creighton. And I'm now at McGill, Gottsteiner, Workman, and Lepp, and, and I couldn't be uh, happier uh, to, to be there. These people have been terrific. It, it's a law firm full of wonderful and wonderfully talented people, and uh, I've never felt more welcome anywhere than I have there. Uh, the office manager, the attorneys, the staff, and, uh, and the man who keeps the building clean. They've all been very welcoming. I've started these talks always with a, with a word about Creighton. And, oh, wrong tool. I started this with a word, always about, with a word about Creighton, and I want to keep that uh, alive. This is Mookie Betts. 
And Mookie Betts is a, um, is a generational baseball player. He's, he's the MVP these days, and uh, he's a superstar. And he has a one-year contract <clears throat> uh, with the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers for $27 million. <laughs> and those of you who were here when Eric Pearson won the Outstanding Professor Award so often that they just gave up and named it after him. <laughs> His son Scott is Mookie Betts' agent. So, I, yeah, I get chills just... $27 million. Well, anyway, this is the worst trade that the Red Sox have ever made, except for this trade 100 years ago. <laughs> when they traded Babe Ruth to the Yankees. Uh, second thing about Creighton, tomorrow over the lunch hour at the law school, there's going to be a presentation by Patrick Strawbridge. Patrick Strawbridge, Patrick Strawbridge is a former student. And uh, he, from Creighton, he clerked for uh, Morris Arnold and then went to the US Supreme Court and he clerked for Clarence Thomas. Currently, he is Donald Trump's lawyer in the, in the uh, subpoena cases in New York State, which caused our daughter to say, how could you teach somebody who's going to end up being like that? <laughs> uh, we have a new he uh, has a, a, a he has someplace else that he had to be. He had a presentation that he'd agreed to, uh, and, but I'm not going to say anything about him. He, I talked about him last year. Um, everybody says he's doing a great job. Everybody I've talked to at the law school, uh, but I want to mention his wife, Kendra. Kendra uh, just out of law school, Bank Tweed in New York City. And Milbank, uh, she was a commercial litigator. Milbank is a real old-time silk stocking New York City law firm. It was founded in 1866. And to me, because the first Civil Rights Act the Civil Rights Act of 1866 designed to protect the rights of newly freed uh, African Americans. And so the Civil Rights Act, here's how it uh, came about. When Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson became the president. Congress overwhelmingly passed the Civil Rights Act and sent it to Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson vetoed it. Congress overrode the veto, and it became law. And then the House of Representatives impeached Andrew Johnson over these policy difference on differences on how to handle Reconstruction. Um, and well, Congress of impeachment to the Senate, and the Senate almost convicted Andrew Johnson. They fell one vote short of convicting Johnson. But uh, Kendra Forshea didn't have anything to do with that. She, um, <laughs> she left Milbank to become a law professor, which is a very wise thing to do. She left Milbank to become uh, a, a law professor, and, 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 um, and she's a good one. She's an estates and, and trusts professor. Um, she, uh, her students, every student of hers that I've talked to says that she is uh, really a terrific teacher. She's the editor-in-chief of the American Bar Association's uh, Family Law Quarterly, and that's quite an honor that she brought to Creighton. Those of you who practice family law, you ought to uh, look her up and, and invite her down to the firm and get to know her. She's uh, a great addition. By the way, Milbank Tweed 
pays their first year lawyers, right out of law school, first year out of law school, $190,000. And the uh, equity partners make $3.85 million. So you're saying to yourself, wow, I bet Kendra's not making that at Creighton. <laughs> so, so maybe it wasn't such a wide choice. Well, you give up things so you can do what you love doing. She chose a substantial cut in pay in earning capacity when she became a law professor, as did I, as did every other law professor. At and um, I remember when I left the Department of Justice, uh, my friends from law school, they all said to me, you could be making $300,000 a year. Uh, I do want to add that the equity partner salaries have gone up since when I graduated from law school. But, but it was easy to give up that $300,000 for what I really wanted to do. To me, the uh, most important thing in my life is my family and my friends. And that includes, uh, like, like Colin Mander, my friend Colin Mander, all of his students are part of his family, and I feel that same way about a lot of you in the room, about Cameron and, and his wife, Jordan. Um, so that bumps up my family by, I don't know, about 4,000 people. Um, and that cut in pay really paid off for me and I hope it paid off for my former students. But now, I do wonder now if my law school friends had said, don't do, go do that, you, you're stupid, you can make $3 million a year. I, I don't know, I might have made a different choice. But <laughs> So there's so much that has happened since last year's talk, and I think that probably many of you suspected that I'd be talking about impeachment. But I'm sick of impeachment. I'm sick of studying it. I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick of hearing about it. And so <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about it today. There's another issue that I want to bring to your attention. And I'll start with this question. There's Andrew Johnson. <laughs> and I, I looked, I must have looked at 100 pictures to get one of Andrew Johnson, and his facial expression is always the same. This man uh, was sour. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about is, is there a new amendment to the Constitution? Do we have a new 28th Amendment? <clears throat> the Constitution lays down two ways that it can be amended. One is for two-thirds of the states to call for a constitutional convention. This opens the Constitution up for complete rewrite. It opens the whole Constitution for change. And as, as an aside, I don't want that to happen. And, it, you know, it's like, it's like exploratory surgery. We're going to cut him open and just see what we can see, what we can take out, see what we can put in, see what needs to be done cosmetically. We can just change the whole darn thing. And I don't um, want this kind of constitutional amendment to come about because we'd end up with a constitution written by dark money, foreign influence, and we've got enough of that already, and the NRA. The second way you do it is targeted surgery. The second way you do it is two-thirds, uh, somebody drafts up the amendment, and then two-thirds of each House of Congress propose the amendment, not the total redo, and uh, three-fourths of the states ratify the amendment. This is targeted. 
I, I don't, it's, like, it's like if we had an amendment that says if the president's secretary of state calls him a moron and if five or more of his close advisors are convicted of felonies and, 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 and he retains Rudy Giuliani to do anything, <laughs> that's, in, that's impeachment. This is the kind of amendment that I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is the amendment that I'm going to talk about. January, uh, let's see, the January 15th, um, like, I don't know, last month, the, the 38th state, today, today it takes uh, three-fourths of the states to, to um, ratify, and that's, today that's 38 states. Last month, the 38th state, Virginia ratified the ERA. So uh, you'll be if you don't know that that happened even because there was lots of other breaking news in the last, in the last little bit. So the first step in amending the Constitution uh, the way uh, this happened is Somebody drafted the amendment. It was a shock to me to learn that the Equal Rights Amendment was written in 1923. But it didn't really go anywhere. And it didn't, it, it, for a number of reasons, two expressed ones, and then I'll get to the unexpressed one, but a number of reasons. And one was that many of, the, many of the proponents of the ERA were interested in getting the right to vote for women. And the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote, was, uh, was put into the Constitution almost simultaneously with this ERA being drafted. So that dampened the enthusiasm of a lot of uh, the supporters of the ERA. And another motivating factor for many of the supporters of the ERA was workplace fairness. It was a broader motivating purpose, equality across the board, but a lot of that was focused on uh, the workplace. And, and, and there was a lot of discrimination against women. That won't surprise anybody. The, uh, there were state laws that barred women from jury service. There were state laws that forbade women from being the administrator of an estate if there was an equally qualified man to be the administrator of the state. Women were barred from uh, many state universities. And married women, in many states there was a law against married women entering into a contract on their own. Married women, contract on their own. And that brings me to Myra Bradwell. The Illinois Supreme Court, Myra Bradwell did everything you need to do to be a lawyer, and so she went to the Illinois Supreme Court and said, uh, you know, give me my law license, and they refused. And here's the reason. The applicant, as a married woman, would not be bound by contracts with her clients because it was illegal in Illinois for a married woman to enter into a contract. So she did what we'd all do if we could afford it. She appealed to the United States Supreme Court and they affirmed the Illinois court. And what I want to talk about is these, is there were three stooges who wrote a concurring opinion in this case saying married woman can't be a lawyer in Illinois. And I want to read a little of that. is the 
of every person, man or woman, to engage On the contrary, the civil law, as well as nature herself, has always recognized a wide difference in the respective spheres and destinies of man and woman. Man is or should be woman's protector and defender. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy of sex makes it unfit for many of the occupations of civil life. The Constitution, which is founded in the divine ordinance, as well as in the nature of things, indicates the domestic sphere as uh, this, properly belonging to the domain and functions of womanhood. The harmony, if not to say identity of interests and views which belong or should belong to the family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent the duties, complications, and incapacities arising out of the married state. But these are exceptions to the general rule. The paramount destiny, the paramount destiny and mission of woman are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. So women, women faced a lot of discrimination. The ERA was designed uh, to, to take care of that. But then it, it, the enthusiasm for the and again. Um, during wage and hour statutes, wage and hour protection constitution. mind and started upholding them. They got a new justice and justices just switched his opinion. And so a, a lot of people thought, well, this uh, discrimination against women in the workplace, we, this, this switch on the court has taken care of that because all these laws are being upheld. Well, of course, as we know, it didn't really take care of it still a lot of discrimination against women, maybe particularly in the context of the workplace, it's lower wages, which persists today. So, so the thing drafted. Step two, Congress uh, has to approve of the of the proposed amendment and they did that in 1972 49 years after the ERA was drafted Congress approved it and they sent it to the states for ratification step two Two-thirds of both houses of Congress uh, have to approve, and that's what happened in 1972. So the ERA now has legs again, and it's in front of the states. So the Constitution requires, as I said today, 38 states have to ratify the amendment. And that was a kind of a slog. People thought, uh, some people thought, uh, you know, this has been taken care of. Some people um, thought that if we pass this amendment, there'll be sex bathrooms. Um, there was a lot of, of fear of having to uh, share things uh, on an equal basis. And, and a lot of the unspoken resistance was from men and some women. If you're old enough, you might remember Phyllis Shafley. Shafley. Um, the, there was a lot of fear among uh, many of uh, men that they, they didn't want their wives outside of the home and out of their obligation to bear and care for their children. But, so it took a, a long time, but 20, in, just this year, uh, in, on January the 15th, 
27 days ago, Virginia ratified the ERA. And they're the 38th state to ratify. So, amendment. And here are the arguments. When I first heard that the 38th state had ratified, um, I was thrilled. It's about damn time. But the more I looked, the more I found it's complicated. Maybe this is not valid. And here's why. First, some people argue that there has to be. Well, after that is why. And for, first of all, the 20. Seventh Amendment, I, I, okay, it's, it's the 28th Amendment. Um, I, sometimes I find myself calling it the 38th Amendment, but it's not. The 27th Amendment was proposed in seventeen eighty nine and it was ratified in 1992. 203 years later. So there's precedent. Applied time limit on ratification. Second, this argument calls to my mind, this there has to be a limit, calls to my mind, so, so you know, now we're almost, uh, we're almost 100 years since it was drafted. So the second, or this argument of, has to be a, an implied limit. Um, calls to my mind something Justice Kennedy said in the same-sex marriage case, the Obergefell case. Uh, he was responding to the argument that marriage has always been the union, a union between a man and a woman. Same-sex marriage has never been protected by the Constitution. Same-sex marriage has been illegal in maybe every state, I don't recall, uh, and in most jurisdictions, it was a crime. And it was described by Chief Justice Berger in, in one opinion as a uh, heinous crime against nature. And it, it was an infamous crime, Berger said, often punishable by death. Well, when Kennedy wrote the same sex Obergefell opinion, he responded to these kinds of arguments this way. Kennedy said, that Kennedy said that new generations have new insights. And the new insight that he had in the Obergefell case was that things have changed and now same-sex marriage is acceptable and, it's, and he wrote it into the equal protection and due process clauses. Modern society has new insights. Well, my answer is that's what just happened in Virginia. It's a modern society that has new insights. And these new insights caused Virginia to ratify. And, and, and of course, the ratification came about because control of the Virginia and, and the legislature switched from Republican to Democrat. But still, the, the, those who elected those new, that new party, they had new rights. So the argument that there has to be a, uh, a time limit uh, doesn't make any sense to me. And I remind you, there's precedent. The previous amendment, uh, it was 203 years before its ratification was complete. And then... Um, Add to this, uh, Dillon versus Gloss. Some argue that Dillon versus Gloss says that there is an implied time limit. It's implied in the Constitution. 
And it does say that, but it's dicta. It's not precedent that must be followed. It's dicta. And the, the Dillon case was about this. In the 18th Amendment, Congress wrote in it, right in the text of the amendment, seven-year time limit on ratification. The time limit was challenged as unconstitutional, and the court said no. When Congress writes into the amendment a time limit, that's constitutional. The rest of the, the stuff about the implied time limit was just verbiage, not essential to the holding. So when the time limit is in the amendment, it has been approved by two-thirds of the members of each house, and it has been approved by three-quarters of the states. So this to the first argument. When Congress passed included preamble, not the text, but a preamble, and the preamble said seven year time limit on ratification of the ERA. The preamble is not law. The preamble to an amendment does not alter the amendment itself, just as the preamble to the Constitution is not law. It's, it doesn't impose and it doesn't block uh, new. It's just an introduction to the amendment and it's just a suggestion from Congress. It is what we think ought to happen, but it's not in the text of the amendment. And So there's a third argument. First argument, there has to be a time limit. Second, uh, Dylan says there's a time limit and, and, and um, but it's not in the text. And third, The, the, as, as, the, as the 1972 suggested time limit approached, Congress passed another joint. It was sent to President Carter and he signed it. So now it's a statute. And that statute extended the suggested deadline to 1982. So now, okay, 19. Ratifications after 1982 don't count. And my response to that is that proposing an amendment requires two-thirds of the members of each house and when Congress passed this statute with Jimmy Carter's signature, it didn't have that two-thirds and three-fourths. You, you can't you can't amend an amendment with a statute. At least, that's my position. You can't amend an amendment with a statute. You have to, if you're going to amend an amendment, you've got to go through the amendment process. Two-thirds and three-fourths. Uh, this is a map that kind of gives you some idea of um, the the uh, the gray is states that didn't ratify. The uh, this is states that did ratify, and coming up, this is states that rescinded their ratification. So it's complicated. The Constitution does not specify a time limit. The amendment in text does not specify a time limit. The implication of a time limit in, in, it seems to me to be for the, the dicta that, the, the implication of a time limit and the dicta in Dillon seem to me uh, not to work. The text of the proposed amendment doesn't include a time limit. Um, and there's clear, there's, 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 there's clear, there, there have been a number of amendments that have in their text specified a time limit. 
So in other words, when Congress wanted to put a time limit on ratification, they knew how to do that. They just wrote it right in to the amendment. The 18th, 20th, 21st, and 22nd Amendments all had time limits. And the 27th says no time limit 203 years later. Well, there are three rules of construction. In constructing the text of a statute or construing the text of a statute or in construing a constitutional a provision in the Constitution, there are three, there are a number of rules, and I'm going to mention three of them, that are supposed to help you in your interpretation. One is the whole. You don't just pick a little piece of it and base your construction on a little piece. Text as a whole. Now, in this case, the text as a whole that we're talking about is all of the amendments. A material variation in terms in a statute, the whole of the statute, or in the whole of the amendments in this case, a material variation in terms suggests that there's a variation in meaning. Now, to me, there is a material variation here. Some of the amendments specify a time limit and others don't. So the, 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 the uh, Material variation, the material variation between these amendments um, says that when Congress means an expiry date, they say it. And says that when you're looking at all these amendments and you're trying to interpret one that doesn't have an expiry date, you look at these others that do have expiry dates and there's a, there's a difference. So the expiry date put into the amendment that's okay. But if there's no expiry date, you can't just put one in. When, in other words, when Congress wanted a proposed amendment to expire after a certain number of years, they know how to do it. Past practice shows they know how to do it. They write it into the amendment. And the third rule of construction is this. We can't find that Congress was unaware of the difference. In other words, turn that around. We, we have to see they're aware that a number of have the difference between the amendments that have a time limit and that don't have a time limit have to mean something as the whole package. And as I said before, there for no time limit the Dillon case, 200, or not the Dillon case, but the ratification of the 27th Amendment 203 years later. So, so far, I find the 28th Amendment valid. I find so far that the uh, ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, is in the Constitution. But here's the kicker. After 1982 deadline set in the statute, which I think is invalid anyway, but we'll right now. After that, three more states ratified and five states rescinded their ratifications, including Nebraska. So, oh, and there are three states that have, have a lawsuit. They've filed a lawsuit uh, trying to stop the, uh, the ratification from being certified. So, now the question is whether states have the power to rescind a ratification. Assuming that the ratification by Virginia is valid and that the rescission of ratifications is not valid, then we don't have an uh, is not valid, then we have an amendment. Assuming that the 
ratification by Virginia and the, and the other two states is valid, and the, and the rescission of the ratification is valid, then we don't have an ERA. So, do the states have the power to rescind? Well, above, when I was talking about Justice Kennedy, I, I said that in Kennedy's opinion when he says new generations have new insights, and I used that as a way um, to defeat one of the arguments being made at the time, you got new insights in the, in the 50, in the almost 50 years uh, between, it's a long time, new and So, do we have an ERA? Well, it seems to me that if, if, the, if these rescissions, including Virginia's, are legitimate based on sort of these this new, they have new insights, then you have to say the states that ended their ratification they had new insights as well. They just went through. So, we don't have and ERA. Well, sadly, I, I, I think we don't have an ERA. Um, but does it matter whether we have an ERA or not? Well, yes, it does matter. It's time we put women. Today, the, the Supreme Court has three levels of scrutiny. The, the federal courts have basically three levels of scrutiny that apply in, in, in most constitutional cases. And they, the, when the Supreme Court uh, implied protection in the Constitution, they implied, well, it's not, it's not the, the worst case. It's not race discrimination. Whoops. It's not race discrimination. I just turned it off. <laughs> Not, no, no, no. Welcome, my friend Dave Summers. <laughs> so they put they, they they put sex discrimination against intermediate scrutiny. This is judicial scrutiny that any constitutional case could get, and this is a little bit. Does it matter? Yes, we need to put women in the Constitution. Second, if we put them in the Constitution, it puts them up to strict scrutiny. It gives them protection equal to uh, the protection on the uh, protection against discrimination on the basis of, of race or national origin. It, it, it put it in the Constitution because this one court has implied it as a right. Well, another court can come along and imply it out of the Constitution. Disimply it, if that's a word. Unimply it, if that's a word. And <clears throat> you say, well, th that it'll never happen here, they're always going to get, women are always going to get this intermediate scrutiny and it strikes down all this discrimination against women. Uh, we don't need uh, strict scrutiny. And it was implied into the Constitution by one court, it can be implied out by another. But you say, yeah, that will never happen. Well. What democracy read Jews out of the Constitution and then started killing them? And you say, but that won't happen here. Well, what country took boatloads of Jews trying to escape the Holocaust and turned them away from, wouldn't let them land? Um, 
notoriously, in 1939, the German ocean liner, the St. Louis, and its 937 passengers were turned away from the port of Miami and forced to go back to Germany, and three-fourths, three-fourths, uh, one-quarter of those passengers were, were killed, were gassed. And remember, over the long haul, new insights can put something into the Constitution, and then later new insights can get it back out of the Constitution. Take, for example, abortion. Take, for example, the same-sex relationship cases out of the Supreme Court. Take, for example, uh, Citizens United, which said that corporations and unions have the full rights of persons and therefore the ability to spend as much money as they want on elections. And finally, we just should do it. We just should put women in the Constitution. Now, I want to just briefly say one more thing. Uh, switching the topic. Some years ago, my talk was on the expansion of executive power. Um, Jefferson, Jefferson, executive branch, Jefferson believed that the, a president doesn't have the power to sign a contract to buy property that has to be done by Congress. And then the French offered Jefferson the Louisiana Territory, and he jumped in and bought it. Um, Lincoln. Lincoln, the Constitution clearly says the writ of habeas corpus can't be suspended except by Congress. But during the Civil War, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. More power. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in an attempt to get the country out of the Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, this time with Congress's approval, but uh, created the New Deal, created the administrative state. The executive agencies now do much, very much, of what used to be Congress's job. George W. Bush, during his administration, he took the power to declare persons to be enemy combatants, just say it, enemy combatant, and federal government would go grab them up and throw them in, in, a, in, in a prison, in a camp, and not allow them any kind of a hearing, not allow them to have a lawyer, not allow them to even tell their family where they were. A huge executive power. And now, during the current administration, this expansion of executive power has taken another leap forward. If the president believes I'm not sure this is exactly what it means, what, what this president believes his or her re-election is in the public interest. And was there ever a president who didn't believe that? If the president believes that his or her is in the public interest, then the president can ask foreign countries to announce and execute uh, a, 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 you know, do of uh, ask for assistance in finding against the president's candidate. And if Alan Dershowitz is to be believed, in the well of the Senate, he explained his position this way the, If the president does something that he thinks will help him get reelected, it's in the public interest. And that kind of thing cannot be a quid pro quo that results in impeachment. Now, personally, I think Alan Dershowitz is not to be believed, but that's what he said. And just a few before, this was the toughest year 
for a topic because there's just so much that happened. And, uh, and except for this little of a previous talk, I'm sick of talking about that. So thank you for coming and uh, see you next year. Professor Finner, on behalf of the OBA and everyone here in attendance, uh, I'd like to present this as a small thank you, and I'll play spoiler. It is not the three million dollars you could have gotten in New York, <laughs> but I'm told if you invest, you eventually it's going to get there. Um, you know, that you got to start laying away money for that young child's <laughs> college education. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's something to look forward to. Um, so we know that the 30th annual was a big monument, but we hope you keep joining us in years future. For everyone else here, thank you very much for coming out. The next OBA meeting is the Medical Legal Dinner. The future speaker is Dr. Matthew Garlinghouse, a professor of neuropsychology. Can there be therapeutic use of endogenous cannabinoids? in Nebraska. Um, and and there'll, and there'll be free samples, so yeah. you're going to want to come to that one. Free samples, a high turnout. Um, dinner's a on, high uh, turnout. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> here all day. Um, dinner's <laughs> on Thursday, March 5th. It's at the Marriott. So hope to see you all there. And with that, I'm going to Thank you.